Hey everybody, this is the Sycamore Show, and I'm so honored to be here with journalist, author, American icon, the world's greatest conspiracy theorist, I've heard him called, Jim Mars. Hi Jim, how are you? Howdy Scott, it's great to be with you. Hi, it's great to be with you. Um, here we are, it's November 11th, 2013, and we're just, if my calculations are right, and they may not be, is, is that not 11 days from the 50th anniversary of the JFK? Now, you, now you're getting into higher math. Yeah. <laughs> if I knew higher math, I'd be a banker and be banking money. <laughs> yes, I, I know we're not numerologists around here, but... Yeah, but it's, a, it's the 22nd will be the 50th anniversary of the Kennedy assassination. And i got to tell you, it's really hard for me to comprehend that because for 30 years I taught a course on the Kennedy assassination at the University of Texas at Arlington. And every uh, fall and spring I would watch all the newsreels all over again and, and look at some of the documentaries with some of the witnesses and their statements and, and pull out and show all the documents and photographs and stuff. So for me it's still very fresh. It's hard to believe it's been 50 years. Yeah, I I assume you've been r around long enough to remember the actual time when it happened, seeing it on TV. Oh, and of course, I was a, I was a journalism major at uh, at North Texas University when it happened, and uh, I was very familiar with Dallas. Uh, I had roommates from Dallas. We'd go in into Dallas quite often, and that's the place to go to party around. And in fact, I had been in Jack Ruby's club and had met Jack Ruby. And I even have a photograph of me taken about a month before the Kennedy assassination uh, uh, up on the stage on uh, Jack Ruby's Carousel Club dancing. <laughs> so, so you were quite connected to this whole incident. Might I ask, where were you on that day? Well, I know it sounds weird because the, the assassination happened at 12.30 uh, p.m. Uh, just after noon, and, but I was asleep. <laughs> I, uh, I had had a, some kind of examination uh, that morning, and I had spent that Thursday night. I'd been up burning the midnight oil, cramming for this test. And so I went and took my test and got back to my apartment about 11 or 11.30, I guess, in the morning, and I was just pooped so I went and laid down on the bed and, and fell asleep and my roommate came running in and woke me up and said uh, wake up said uh, you know somebody shot the president and uh, so we got up and we had this little old cheap TV that had a little about an 8 inch screen on it <laughs> <laughs> and uh, black and white and uh, I got a, we turned that on and started watching the coverage um, and I know that I've been watching it for some length of time, 10 or 15 minutes or so, uh, before they finally announced that uh, it was official he was dead. And we know that happened just a little after 1 p.m. So that means I was probably watching the, uh, the news uh, within, say, 15 minutes of the shooting. So, And then I went out and gathered up all the local newspapers including the campus paper and any of the uh, extra editions that they but most of them put out extra editions as the news continued to pile in and as uh, witnesses came forward they'd keep putting out uh, new editions and I, so I got I think most of those editions and so I think I can legitimately say that I've been on the case uh, within 15 minutes of the shooting wow wow that I can believe if anyone would be, it's you. So you must have quite the collection of hard copies of documents and whatnot over yeah, um, the last yeah, 50 years. Yeah, sorry. My wife calls me a pack rat. <laughs> uh, and not only do I have all the things I've collected, but I'm sitting here looking at a pile of old newspapers from St. Louis that somebody sent me a big package here just the other day, and it's uh, the original newspapers from that weekend, along with the Time uh, magazine and Life magazine. Uh, so a lot of people over the years have known of my interest, so they've given me uh, a lot of printed material that came out at the time. Now, how long did it take, by your memory, for conspiracies to start popping up regarding this case? Was it a while yeah. No, in my case, it was fairly quick, um, and in fact, that afternoon, because as I heard witnesses 
and heard them describe the gunshots. And since then, I've uh, interviewed dozens of people that were in Dealey Plaza, including former House Speaker Jim Wright, who was riding in the motorcade, and former mm. Senator Ralph Yarborough, he was in the motorcade riding next to Lyndon Johnson, and um, some of the Dallas police. And, and they all say the same thing. They said there was one shot and then a pause and then two shots right on top of each other. Kind of a pow, pow, pow. Right. Well, even at that time, Scott, I had uh, I had been hunting. I grew up in Texas. Everybody had guns. Uh, I had some bolt action rifles. I'd been deer hunting, and so when I heard this, and then they came out and they said they caught Lee Harvey Oswald, and they were immediately saying they thought he was the only one involved, and they said he had this old World War II bolt action Manlicker Carcano rifle, yes. and. Right then, I was going, wait a minute, how do you get a pow-pow out of a bolt-action rifle? Because, and this was later confirmed by the FBI, it takes two seconds just to cock the bolt and pull the trigger. So the best you can get on a bolt-action rifle is a pow, pow, pow. So when you get a pow-pow, I'm going, wait a minute, how do you, how does one person get a pow-pow? So, but at that time, you have to understand, this was, America was a different time and place. And everyone, we were just coming off of World War II, and all our fathers and brothers and uncles had all fought in the war, and we had won the war, and we were God's gift to uh, democracy and freedom, and and uh, we had unlimited faith and confidence in the government. If J. Edgar Hoover had told us that 2 plus 2 equals 5, we would have thought, well, you know, I always thought it was 4, but I guess it must be 5 if J. Edgar Hoover says so. And so I, I didn't really, like everyone else, I didn't really have, uh, I, I was just a little discomforted and thinking, I, I don't quite get this. And then, of course, on Sunday, when I'm up watching TV again, and uh, they had postponed the transfer of Oswald for about an hour, but they said they were going to televise it. Um, and so we're watching TV, and we watched Jack Ruby step out and shoot Oswald while he's handcuffed to you know, into a whole room full of policemen in the basement of the Dallas police station. And, again, they immediately start saying, well, he's just kind of a lone nut and nobody knew what he was going to do, and you know, and and I'm going, wait a minute. <laughs> so one lone nut shoots the other lone nut right. in the basement of the police station. So I had, real, I had real problems right away. But, again, I didn't have anything to put uh, to a context in which to put that until about 1972. And, uh, yeah, the fall of 1972, following the Watergate burglary. And they had, uh, of course, caught the Watergate burglars, and they were being good troops. They weren't talking. And then all of a sudden, Eugene McCord um, confessed to the judge that, okay, okay, actually I'm working for the committee to reelect the president. Well, President Nixon had been loudly proclaiming the whole time that he didn't know anything at all about all this, okay? And now we find out that the burglars are directly tied to his reelection campaign. And so it, that was kind of my epiphany. That's when I realized that the President of the United States could and would and had lied to me, okay? And at that, everything began to fall together. So by 1975, when they were talking about forming a House committee to reinvestigate the Kennedy assassination along with the Martin Luther King and uh, uh, Robert Kennedy assassination, uh, I put all of the evidence that I could put together uh, in an article, and it was published in my new, the newspaper I was working for at the time, the Fort Worth Star Telegram, and uh, it started on the front page and then jumped to almost a whole page of copy where I laid out all the evidence, and my lead said that if this new proposed House committee would do an honest job, they were likely to find that there was a coup d'etat in the United States in 1963 with the complicity of some federal officials. And I'll tell you, Scott, that everything that's come out since then, nothing has shaken that conclusion. That's exactly what happened, and that should explain the whole Kennedy assassination because anyone could have killed the president, uh, KGB agents, uh, Castro agents, 
mafia, hitmen, uh, CIA assassins, you know. And yes, even the proverbial low nut, anyone could have killed him. The, the, the question and the proof is, who had the power to cover all that up and cover up the truth of the assassination and keep it so confused that 50 years after the fact, no one you know, has a clear understanding of what went on, and I maintain only officials at the highest levels of the federal government. Uh, in fact, the two men that I would name as legally guilty in the Kennedy assassination or his successor, Lyndon Baines Johnson, and his old next-door neighbor and buddy, J. Edgar Hoover, then head and director of the FBI. Now, can I prove that those two men ordered the assassination of President Kennedy? No. But what I can prove, beyond any reasonable shadow of a doubt uh, to any uh, objective person, is that both of those men took actions that blocked and stymied any kind of meaningful investigation into the assassination, which is why it's so controversial today. Well, that makes them under our legal system accessories after the fact, okay? And I know here in Texas we've executed people uh, who are accessories after the fact uh, because the facts of the case show they didn't pull the trigger but they knew about it. They drove the car. They provided the gun or they provided the money, and they are accessories to the crime. And under uh, our legal system, they're considered just as guilty as the person who pulled the trigger. Yep. So I'm saying today that it really is not that important to figure out how many shots were fired and from what direction and how many gunmen, et cetera, et cetera. What's important to understand is is that the top officialdom of the United States uh, can be legally considered guilty uh, in this crime. Absolutely incredible. You're right on the money with this. Um, I wanted to, believe it or not, ask about other things besides JFK, even though we could clearly go on for the entire time at plus with this topic. Um, right. But in the interest of covering all the other bases, because I know you have so much knowledge, I just wanted to ask you this general question, actually. Well, strange. Hold fun. your question for a half second. Let me get in an unabashed, uh, <laughs> selfish uh, commercial plug here. Oh, please. Uh, my yeah. book, Crossfire, uh, which, of course, uh, was on the New York Times bestseller list for a long time back in the 80s, uh, and was a basis for the Oliver Stone movie JFK is now has now been re-released in an updated, uh, expanded version with a tremendous index, so that you can actually move around in it and look up uh, the uh, e the individuals involved, the organizations involved, and and just read the index. It will you know shake your world because you'll find out stuff that you uh, never knew, such as the. Just as Kennedy's motorcade passed the scuba depository, all the electricity went out and all the phones went Whoa. out. It's the only place in Dallas that I know of that that happened. That's kind of suspicious. Uh, the fact that Henry Wade, the district of attorney, the, uh, early the next morning uh, said he was developing information that there was a vast conspiracy and they weren't going to let anybody go unpunished. But then within hours, he was changing his tune and said, no, 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 it's just one person. And, and uh, you know, yeah. blah, blah, blah. And on and on and on. So you're going to find a lot of good stuff, including a, a blow up of a of uh, Zapruder frame 314, which clearly shows that the driver did not shoot Kennedy. Okay, that, that's been some misinformation that's been floating around out there for a long time. But anyway, thank you for letting me get in a plug. The new Crossfire, the plot that killed Kennedy, and it's out from basic books right now. Yeah, let me, I, I did have a question actually about that book specifically, um, which is, that was that was your very first book in terms of uh, as far as what I saw. The, your, your yeah. Book, right. When that yeah, came out in. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, that came out in what year was it? That 19, was eighty nine. Eighty eighty nine. That's right. So that was. So I mean, after your long history of journalism, you come out with that book in eighty nine, and obviously it was a barn burner. It. Uh, well, it, I you know as a reporter here in Texas, I had kept up with a lot of the. Texas researchers, uh, Mary Farrell over in Dallas, and uh, Gary Shaw down in Cleveland, uh, Penn Jones, uh, Jack White, uh, a lot of these people. 
Gary Mack back when he was actually uh, researching and telling the truth. And uh, I had kept up with all of their uh, work and realized that most people had never heard any of this stuff, okay, because sure. the uh, corporate mass media is so controlled. Uh, so uh, that's when I decided, well, uh, I, I guess I need to write all that down. So I put it all down in, in the book Crossfire, and, and you're right. It was just uh, immediately well-received. That's that's great. I love it. And then from that book, you've since gone on to write several more books on various levels of the conspiracy, shall we call it. Um, well, not just that conspiracy, but some, many different conspiracies. Oh, yeah. I, when I say the, I mean the, the big one. <laughs> the, the big one, okay. Yeah. Um, and I remember the first time I ever heard of you, which was probably, I don't know, sometime about the year 2000, something like that. Um, it was someone told me to read this book called Alien Agenda by Jim Mars. And I thought, wow, that sounds interesting, just right off the bat. Um, tell me how you got into that sort of angle of okay. the truth and also as a corollary where do you think we're actually at with the real alien agenda right now in 2013 okay. yeah well i got into it actually as a as a follow on to crossfire uh, because as i would travel around the country i would ask people what do you think is the next big deep dark secret government cover up and it's interesting, Scott, everyone from publishers in New York to cab drivers would say, well, I'd really like to know what's the truth about the UFOs. You know, is there really yep. something there? Are they real? What's going on? Yep. And I thought, you know, I'd like to know that too. And interestingly enough, as a reporter for all those years, I actually kind of kept up with that. And in fact, it covered some stuff. We had a whole spate of cattle mutilations, or well, including horses not just cattle, but animal mutilations, we'll say, uh, down here in Texas. And I had been covering some of that and realized that there was a UFO component to that issue. Uh, I, had, I had kept up with UFOs uh, since a kid um, because I, I uh, one day cleaning out the attic, I found a watercolor I had done of a UFO that landed on the highway out near Level in Texas in West right. Texas, and I had painted this picture based on newspaper accounts, and I went back to check when that happened. I think it happened in 1958 or something like that. So I've been on the UFOs from the get-go. In fact, uh, a uh, friend of mine that was in the university with me uh, sent me a clipping that I had forgotten about that was written about 1965, I guess, uh, and it was an editorial I wrote for the campus newspaper saying that we probably needed to take the uh, UFO issue seriously because there's obviously something going on and although we didn't know precisely what it was, uh, it, we should not be laughing at it. We should be paying attention and, and trying to figure out what it is. And so I'd been at that for some time. So as I went around and gathered up all the information, I produced uh, Alien Agenda, which started off saying the, the debate over whether UFOs exist is over with, okay? They're real. They're here. The question has become, who are they and what do they want? What is the alien agenda? Um, and I'll tell you, that book, by the way, I have been told, is that has become the top-selling nonfiction book on UFOs in the world. I believe it. Because, yeah, yep. It's been translated into about a dozen languages. So that's what got me into the UFO issue. Uh and I think that came out about 1997. Uh, now, since then, there's only been a few incidences of the summer, I believe the summer of 97, just as in my book was coming out, is when we had the uh, thing fly over Phoenix. Right, Phoenix uh, Lights, yeah. Yeah, and then mm -hmm. in 2010, of course, we had the Stephenville uh, uh, sightings. So, so there's Texas. been a couple of other big things, but other than that, everything, uh, all the history of the UFO, uh, going all the way back to the to the possibility of ancient astronauts, is pretty well covered in the alien agenda. Now, as to your question about where we are today, mm -hmm. uh, I think about all I can say is just more of the same. Okay, there have been, uh, but today it's a whole different uh, view of the of the issue. Uh, way back there in the 50s, 60s, 70s, even into the 80s, 
it, it, there was a legitimate argument that they didn't exist, that, uh, you know, there was no such thing. Um, it, they were just um, misidentified aircraft or uh, maybe some uh, unknown uh, mass psychosis. Swamp gas. So, swamp gas, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, uh, but I love the... Uh, Mass psychosis, because even as a as a newsman back then, I'm thinking, hey, wow, uh, a heretofore uh, undiagnosed contagious mass psychosis. You know what a story. Yeah. Uh, but you don't ever hear that anymore. And why? Because of the advent of the camcorder and the and the cell phone camera. And today you go on the internet and you type in UFO images and. You could spend maybe the rest of your life looking at pictures. They're so numerous. And even if you write off half of them as photoshopped or faked, you still got thousands and thousands of photographs of these things. Uh, you know, and obviously you cannot take a picture of a hallucination or, or, or uh, a mass psychosis. So, and then when you actually study the history, because starting in the year 2000, I, uh, at the University of Texas Arlington, I actually began teaching a course on UFOs. Wow. And the, one of the first assignments I would give the class is to come back the next week uh, prepared to give an example of a UFO experience or sighting that happened before the year 1900. Mm. And uh, most of them would go, what? Because, you know, they, like most people, thought it only started about 1947 with the crash at Roswell or maybe with the Foo Fighters during World War II. But uh, the next week they'd all come back and they would all be so excited because once you go and look, you find references to flying things and flying objects. You know, well, you can go back all the way to Ezekiel in the Bible, right, with mm -hmm. the fiery wheel going through the air. Hello. Sounds yeah. like a saucer to me. Yeah. Um, and they were just so excited because they found out that actually UFOs have been reported throughout history. So, And they're continuing to be today. Now, the alien agenda. Well, I can't tell you for certain what it is, but I can tell you with some certainty what it's not. I don't think that the, these whoever's visiting us and wherever they're from I don't believe their agenda is to attack us, uh, to blow up our cities or whatever, like we see in movies like Independence Day. Um, because if that's the case, and once you understand that UFOs have been with us throughout history, then it makes no sense that they would not attack us when all we had to defend ourselves with was swords or bows and arrows. Uh, you know, and, and, and until they wait till now when we have space platforms and and laser weapons and all kinds of stuff. Uh, so I don't think the agenda is to attack us. Yeah, it or seems conquer the world. It seems more like their agenda is to to alter society and people's yes. minds to whatever yes. ends full ends it might be. Um, yes, and I'm sure you've had people who have addressed this issue that back in the 60s and 70s. There were numerous reports and now very well-documented instances of UFOs flying over our missile defenses, and uh, the launch codes would get messed up. And, uh, of course, to the paranoid military mind, uh, for instance, Colonel Corso, who wrote the day after Roswell, uh, he, he pretty much portrays them as enemies. Mm. And, I, and I interviewed him, and I said, well, you know, Colonel Corso, what, what makes you think they're enemies? He says, well, they'd fly over our military installations, and there were no fly zones, and we'd tell them to stop, and they wouldn't stop. <laughs> you know, we <laughs> couldn't control them. So, but, you, you know, I think if you look at it objectively, you might find out that, yes, they were messing with the nuclear launch codes to prevent us from starting a nuclear war and blowing each other up. And this connects to JFK because this is basically during the time of the whole Cuban Missile Crisis, right? Yes, that and onward, all through the evil empire, right? Days, you know, yeah, exactly. Uh, and that's another thing interesting about that it ties the two uh, subjects together. Uh, in the fall of '63, there is a document, a memo from Kennedy White House to uh, the head of the CIA, ordering him to turn over all their UFO files to the White House, 
and he right. gave them a deadline of February the 1st, 1964. Well, of course, it never happened because he was assassinated in November of 1963. Uh, but, uh, and the UFOs, of course, is one of the most tightly held secrets uh, in the U.S. government, although today it's not much of a secret because you see aliens in movies on TV, even in commercials, yeah. and bumper stickers and T-shirts and the whole thing. Uh, but uh, but officially they don't exist. Right? Yeah, I, that that gets me to a further question, which is you have a new new book, newish book. I don't know if it's your very last one, which asks the question: Do the global elite conceal ancient aliens? Yes, um, that's my latest book. That is the latest. Occulted history. Occulted history. That's right. That's correct. Yeah. Um, and and let so, me let me jump. Let me quickly point out that when I use the term occulted. I use it in the astronomical sense, okay? Uh, you're not going to read about witches or, or zombies or, right. or devil worship or things that we all too often associate with the word occult. The word occult simply means hidden. Yeah. Uh, and when the, yeah, I used it in the astronomical sense in that when the moon eclipses the sun, it, it, it's called an occultation. It occults the sun. It hides the sun. So our occulted history simply means our hidden history. And my working hypothesis was can we connect the growing popularity of the subject of ancient astronauts, extraterrestrials here on the Earth, thousands of years ago, can they be connected to any of the secret societies or to what uh, some people call the New World Order today? And the surprising answer was yes, they yes. can. Yes, that would be my guess. <laughs> and, yeah, so that, my question would be if, if they're trying to occult these things or they're trying to hide them, why, why the TV shows, Ancient Aliens? Why, why so much revealing of this information right now? Is it just that's the time? The, the stars have aligned and it, it, they demand it? The, the universe demands it? Well, yes, basically. I think that it's the old line, truth will out. It is the truth, and you can't keep it hidden and buried forever and ever. So it's all going to come out. But there's also this, Scott. Consider this. I think the people who control... Uh, the five corporations that control everything we see and hear, yeah. uh, the media corporations, uh, and they control the banking system and they control the pharmaceutical system and the energy systems. They don't really care if we if we know that there's aliens out there. Okay, what right. they care about, what they care about, is that if we know for certain that there's extraterrestrial life out there, sophisticated. Well, then we're going to know, we know for certain, that there's alternative technologies out there. So why should we be paying ever-increasing price for gasoline, for example, based on petroleum, which is not only, you know, rising in cost, but also polluting the planet? Why should we be slaves to petroleum? When we know there's other technology out there, that's what they don't want out because if we know there's a, other alternative technology, it might upset their monopolies. Now, at the same time, the our benevolent space brothers aren't necessarily coming down and giving everyone a flying water-powered car <laughs> or a self-heating home or anything like that. So it seems like there's still that... that uh, uncertain gray zone. Pardon the, pardon the pun. Well, I think I think there's uh, I think there's something out there that's very very similar to the, the uh, concept in Star Trek, which is the prime directive. Right. Okay. Uh, that there is perhaps not a law as we understand a law with police and enforcement and everything, but but uh, just a, an an agreement among the sentient. Uh, beings of the of the universe that it's simply not right or proper to go down and, and overtly interfere with the natural evolution of the species. And I think that's why that they, they tend to take a hands-off uh, attitude towards us, although I think there are some who go, well, those poor humans, you know, they're about to blow themselves up. Uh, Mm -hmm. My uh, my line always has been that, you know, in 1945 when they set off the first atomic bomb at Alamogordo, New Mexico, uh, I think that sent energy ripples throughout the universe. 
and somewhere somebody said, "Oh my God, the kids have found the matches." Yep. And uh, they, so I think there's been an effort since then to uh, try to keep us from blowing ourselves up, and maybe even handing us a little bit of technology. Yeah. Uh, it's for like, example, uh, right following the Roswell crash of 1947, uh, the uh, our technical and technological advancements just exploded. Hello. Yes. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. I thought you dipped out there. Oh no. I just. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, you know, we've got all this stuff today: fiber optics and miniaturization, computerizations, and night vision, and all of this stuff. And if you, when you get get down into the core of it, you find people like uh, uh, astronaut. Uh, Edgar Mitchell, who uh, and others, Colonel Corso, who says, who said that uh, we got all this explosion of technology uh, through the acquisition of of ET technology. Yeah, it's kind of like maybe uh, they were waiting for us to invent a warp drive, something peaceful, so they could introduce themselves properly. But then they they saw it and they. You know, <laughs> but all we do is produce weapons. Yep. Right? Exactly. So they have to they have to just remain a little speck in the sky for uh yeah. the general population to latch well, on to. I think we I think we're in a conditioning process. Uh there was a, I remember reading about a a uh, incident down in South America where they were clear cutting some of the rainforest and they stumbled across a stone age tribe down there that had never been exposed to to modern society and uh unlike the past where they would have rushed in with Bibles and blankets and clothes and stuff, you know. Uh, they actually cordoned off the area, uh, not to keep them in, but to keep everybody else out. And then they sent in some selected scientists, anthropologists, and uh, they would let themselves be seen, uh, you know, like up on a mountain or off over on a distant uh, bluff somewhere. And then uh, over a period of time, they slowly would uh, would let themselves be seen a little closer and a little closer until they were like uh, the until the natives got uh, comfortable with the idea that there's somebody else here. They're different from us, but they don't seem to be harmful. They don't seem to be wanting to cause us any danger. So maybe it's okay until they finally made some contact. And then at the contact, they uh, about as far as they would go to help those people out was to give them some metal tools and knives and stuff to kind of make their life a little bit easier, but not enough to completely uh, destroy their culture. And I think, Scott, that the same thing is happening to us today. The national polls of the 1950s showed that uh, virtually no one believed there was life outside of the earth. Hmm. And today, the polls show just about the exact opposite. Most thinking people today are certainly at least open to the idea of extraterrestrial life, if not actively supportive of that idea. So I think we are have been and are continuing to be in a conditioning process so that when they do make face-to-face contact, uh, people don't just freak out. Yeah, there will be a little bit less freaking out, I think, um, we with hope. all all this propaganda, positive and negative, just people have seen it so much. Um, do you think? Do you think that there's a lot of talk out there uh, about people being implanted with certain thoughts and ideas? Do you think humanity, as in, in general, have our own thoughts, or are we being directed and conditioned on a mass scale, even down to the personal level? Um, well, now you're getting in some really spooky areas here. Uh, I have uh, always thought that uh, you know they can they can beat you, they can torture you, they can waterboard you, you know, and all like that. But uh, they can't really uh, change your mind. Your thoughts are your own. But unfortunately, today there is uh, the technology. You might want to Google uh, S S S S technology, hmm. and you'll find you'll find that we do have the capability of uh, subliminally influencing people and projecting thoughts and ideas and concepts into the minds not only of individuals but of whole groups of people. 
Now, I'm not saying they're doing that. That's the big question. It's not a question of can they do that. Now, right. The answer is yes, they can. The question is, are they? And that, you know, it's the same uh, dichotomy we have with uh, NSA spying. You know, do they have the capability of monitoring your telephone and your emails and your, in fact, your entire computer? Yes. But the question is, are they? And you know, it would seem to be pretty much impossible for them to try to monitor, you know, 300 million people uh, all at the same time. You'd have to have, you know, half the population trying to watch the other half. Right. Uh, they seem to be working towards that, but I find it hard to believe that it's that way right now. So, anyway, in answer to your question, there is that capability, but, you know, if your mind is being influenced subtly, how are you going to know it? You probably wouldn't. You probably wouldn't. Because, so, uh, yeah. It's all still- I know is is that uh, you need to maintain a, a good uh, ego huh. and a little bit of self-assurance. Uh, I know there's been times when I suddenly get a little streak of, of curiosity or fear maybe or like uh-huh. or uneasiness, you know, about something. Yep. And I just go, hey, wait a minute, you know, <laughs> let's move on. Right. Uh, or I guess that we've all experienced, uh, you know, you wake up in the morning and you say, I don't even want to get out of bed. But you say, I've got work to do, so you get up and you go on. Sure. Like, we and have we to. just have to take charge and responsibility for ourselves. Yep, we have to push through no matter what. That's one of the big. Yep. One of the big motifs, I think, I've been realizing. That, that uh, technology you mentioned is silent sound spread spectrum. That's right. Quadruple that's S. I'm going to look into this. <laughs> yeah, that's, but that's uh, what it is. It's pretty spooky because they can implant uh, thoughts into your subconscious that you're not even consciously aware of. Woof. Uh, but I think people need to know this because, you know, look, the, look at how this nation's changed, uh, to me, overnight. You know, right. It, 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 I grew up in Texas. And everybody had a gun. Nobody shot anybody. And now today it's, oh, we've got to take up all the guns because somebody might shoot somebody. And right. somebody does. But when you check and you find, that, you find out that almost 100% of the time when you have these crazed lone gunmen or a school shooting or something like that, if you check long enough and hard enough and if they don't cover up the facts, which they have in many instances, you find that those shooters are on psychotropic drugs. Okay, or or just coming off of them, yep. and so you know the, the problem seems to be the the homicidal tendencies created by these drugs, but then we never hear about that because these pharmaceutical uh, products are, are among the biggest advertisers on TV and radio. Good thing I don't watch them for now. Yeah, there you go. See, you yeah. still got some sanity. <laughs> yeah. Although I I definitely seen it all. Um yeah, it's either a drug company or an insurance company on commercials. It's about it at this That's point. It. Or, or they're trying to sell you a truck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, big how many trucks can someone buy? I don't know. Yeah. Maybe in Texas exactly. It's different. Exactly. Uh, now And yeah, uh, have you ever thought about this just going down that road briefly? Yeah. You know, we are the most consuming society in the history of the world. And how do you create such a consumer society? Well, you're not going to do that if everybody's happy and placated and satisfied. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You have to create total dissatisfaction with everything. I need a new home. I need a new car. I need a new computer. And, of course, mentioning computers, uh, my computers are something else. If your computer is six months old, it's obsolete, you know? Yeah, not to and mention it'll... Got to get a new one, got to get yeah. a new one. And, you know, they used to make things to last. Right. Uh, I have a 1936 model Mercedes, and it's still running. Wow. (laughs) Because they they made it to last. But these new cars, you know, you get about three years or about uh, 75,000 miles, and uh, after that they start falling apart, you know, and it's called planned obsolescence. Yep, I can't buy buy a laptop that lasts even a year. There you go. And And then, then you have to turn around and go buy another one. Okay, now see that they've got you in two ways there. Number one, because the old one ain't gonna work very well, or going to break down, so you got to go get another one. And the other yep. is, is that they're constantly advertising so that you're uh, you're uh, are not satisfied 
with the one you got. You want a newer one or a slicker one or something's got mm-hmm. bells and whistles or that takes prettier pictures or, you know, or whatever. So they, they've turned us into a whole nation of dissatisfied people. Yeah, it's, and you can't stand tall and proud when you're dissatisfied with life. It just exactly doesn't really work. All right, so and you just, can't even feel good about yourself. You know, I'm unworthy. <laughs> My computer's six months old. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, I'm in line for the next Apple product for a day and a half. I mean, <laughs> you're sleeping on the street. You can't even stand up. Um, so, uh, you, I remember I saw a le- um, one of your lectures. I don't want to call it a lecture, but a talk you Let's gave. Call it a presentation. Presentation. And you said in the beginning that you're a generalist with a capital G and that yeah. most people aren't that anymore. Why aren't people that and what, are, what, what is that? How, what separates you as being a generalist and everyone else is, uh, I guess, a specialist, we'll call well, it. Because as a society, we've been pushed into specialization. Uh, you know, if you want to go into banking, you need no banking. If you want to be a, be a lawyer, you have to go to law school. Uh, even if you're going to be an auto mechanic, you need to learn mechanics, okay? And most people, that takes up pretty much of their time learning their specialty, uh, and there's really not any time or energy left to become pretty well acquainted with lots of other topics. Uh, it, it, and it's a, it's amazing, but then I've always just been an inquisitive person and, uh, yeah, I want to know. I want to know what's going on. I want to know why something works. I want to know why. I, I You know, it, this may be kind of anal, but I can't go along and see a sign that has a abbreviation like the, uh, say, the uh, AAA, you know. And a lot of people, I guess, they'd, you'd see a sign that says, join the AAA. And a lot of people, I guess, would just keep going. But me, I want to know, wait a minute, what's the AAA? Well, it's the American Automobile Association. Yeah, Triple A. Yeah, to yeah. play. I mean, I just I just want to know what everything is. I I'm not a revolutionary. I don't necessarily want to change everything. I just I just want to know what it is. And so, I've got a pretty good uh, rounded education, uh, and, uh, and and on the degree to journalism, I, I uh, ended up taking a smattering of all kinds of things. Uh, a, uh, there are all the ologies. I had courses in anthropology and criminology and sociology <laughs> and psychology and uh, education courses. Uh, you know, I'm taking a little bit of everything. Plus, I have continued to read and study as I go through life. And as a result, I, I like to think I could probably carry on a decent conversation with just about anybody on just about any subject. And that's, that's why I call myself a generalist. I don't claim to have any particular uh, yep that knowledge in any one particular thing. Although I guess I guess I do probably know a little more about the Kennedy assassination than most people. Sure, that's Simply like your I've dealt with it my whole life. <clears throat> yeah, that's um, that's your your what you're best known for. But anyone who looks will see you've covered many of these other topics that are all right. worthy of looking into. And yeah, it reminds me. There's a quote from Robert Heinlein, the uh, the uh, sci-fi Science author, yeah. and who says basically what you're saying. He says a human should know how to do all these different things: cook a meal, shoot a cannon, steer a ship. Specialization is for insects, and that's exactly basically what you're saying. Like we're not. Well, what this leads to is, and I see this constantly. Uh, you know, it, it's just like okay. <laughs> this is, this may be a bad illustration, but I was reading a really sad story today about a 13-year-old kid out in L.A. Uh, who had a plastic gun, uh, toy gun, that looked kind of like an AK-47. Right. And these cops rolled up and said, hey, you know, and, he, and they said, drop the gun. And, of course, he's startled. He just turns mm-hmm. around. but he didn't, uh, he didn't drop the gun, but he turned around towards them, and they shot him and killed him. Mm-hmm. You know? All right. Now, that's terrible. That's yeah. just, you know. I think they need better training. We need to do something. But the politicians, these people who have no general knowledge, all they can do is have their knee-jerk reaction. So their immediate reaction was they want to propose new laws, more laws as if we don't have enough already, No. that requires any plastic gun has to be painted a bright color, okay, orange or green or something, you know. And on the surface, that sounds great, but wait a minute. If you think it through, so what's that going to lead to? That means the terrorists are going to start painting their AK-47s bright orange, right? Right. 
I mean, come on. You've got to use your head about these things. Yeah, it's always minutiae and semantics, never the meat and potatoes of... Oh, it's always pass the law and everything will be okay. Absolutely. Uh, that's just, that's just, in fact, that whole gun issue. Yep. You know, if you, it, 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 everybody's divided because on the one hand you got people who say, "Well, take up all the guns and everything will be peaceful." Right. And then you got, on the other hand, the other half of people who go, "No, if you take up all the guns, only the criminals and, and the tyrants will have guns." You know. And of course, neither one of them are addressing the real problem, which is not the guns; it's the people who misuse them. Why are they so screwed up? Why do they want to go and misuse a gun? Like I said, I grew up in Texas. Everybody had a gun, but nobody shot anybody. Mm-hmm. You know? there, there were very few homicides. Yep, because the uh, the core of society, the rotting core, has just been allowed to fester. Exactly. And... They don't want to address the real issues of poverty and discrimination and and illegal immigration and gangs and all kinds of things that are, that right. are actually the genesis of the problem. Right, stuff that might make you sound insensitive, quote unquote, if you brought it up, yes, which exactly. is exactly exactly the opposite, really, because insensitive is letting people die and you know waste away in prison and whatever else other. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, the exactly. Crack- but they don't want to address the real the real causes because that might ha- cause people to take a hard look at our society. Yeah. And what the heck we're doing anyway? Yeah, no one wants to get criticized. I think is a big, uh, a big uh, part of that. You know, no one wants to actually face down people questioning them or, you know, even saying bad things about them. To them, that's worth, that's worth being, being basically a, a destroyer of everything else. You know, let yeah. it all slip by, let it all slide by. Yeah, um, uh, yeah. they have the idea that it's just, they just pass enough laws and and have tough enough cops, everything will be all right. But all it's doing is polarizing the society and creating more problems. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, on that uh, somewhat dark note, what <laughs> what do you think, just give me your quick outlook for the medium-term future of both the United States and the world. I'm thinking about 20 to 50 years out from now. What What can we expect? Okay. Well, in the meantime, you better have a pretty good supply of Clean drinking water and some food <laughs> stashed away. Okay. Uh, but uh, and I think we're going to go through some fairly rough times. Uh, but if we all stick together, keep a good heart, and work for the benefit of the whole instead of every man for himself, uh, I think we're going to get on through, and I think we're going to see a time of uh, of uh, peace and, and uh, prosperity, uh, if not prosperity, at least peace and contentment. Uh, for most people, but we're going to have to go through some rough sailing first, and that's why uh, if you if you can possibly get out of the city, you ought to get out of the city. Mm. If you can't get out of the city, then you need to organize in your communities so that your communities can take care of each other, watch each other's back. Um, one of the things that I I know uh, during World War II in Europe, uh, when uh, there was such privation. They would take public squares, public parks, and they'd plant vegetables, you know, so there was food for everybody. Uh, and I think we need to be doing that today. If you got a mm. grassy area there, a, a median strip, say, but on the freeway or a, or a little park, I think you ought to be able to plant vegetables and fruit trees and things that produce edibles. Mm. Uh, and yet our government is now prosecuting people for doing that in towns yep. and zoning areas say, no, you can't do that. You can't grow vegetables in your front yard. Well, what do you mean? Why not? Is this free country or not? And no, no it's not. <laughs> growing, uh, yeah, growing your own food is uh, anti-government. You need to go to exactly. Ralph's. Yeah, why, what, what's that all about? Don't they want us to eat and eat healthy and eat organic food? No. They want us to be totally dependent on government so that they can march us around, tell us where to go, how to live, and what to eat. Yeah, and in my in my opinion, government doesn't just mean people in Washington, you know, sitting around in chambers. It's everything. It's the supermarket. It's the way your whole society works. It's the way it's exactly. set up set up for you to um to follow it to the T. Exactly. Yeah, and um and yeah. the the secret is the way to try to avoid avoid a dark future is to start getting active today on the local level. Run for the school board, run for city council, uh, you know, run for county commissioner. 
Uh, yeah. Get active and start trying to turn things around because for far too long, and I've heard people for years say, well, you know, let Washington take care of this. <laughs> well, they have. Okay? Yeah. And they, it's not a pretty picture. Yeah, they take care of stuff, but in the mafia sense. Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. They'll take care of anyone who gets in their way. <laughs> I but, like that. That's yeah. right. You know, <laughs> but you know what? What about Guido? <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's taken care of already. We but yeah, I mean, you know, I think all I've been able to do so far is is just try to reach out to people like you and and talk to you. You know, I have I haven't yet taken that physical action enough or the uh, the real community stuff, but but. You know, this the is this is, coming. Yeah, this, this is my starting point. I think with with people like you who give us that example, who have that you know, real person, real truth uh, thing about them. You know, that's that's uh, gives us that guiding light for all the rest of us. So um, I really just thank you for for doing this. You know, I, I know you've done thousands of interviews and talked to some of the top people in in the game and everything, but. Uh, I can really appreciate you taking this time to uh, to talk to me well, this fine day. Well, thank you, and uh, you know, hey, just remember, we're all in this together, okay? Sure. And mm -hmm. it's you know, not not you know, no one's ever <laughs> going to be able to take care of things by themselves. We've all got to work together. So I think we all just need to agree to disagree about various subjects. And, mm -hmm. and what we need to agree on is that we want uh, it to be free. We want the freedom. <laughs> and the liberty to be who we are and what we want to do as, as long as we take the responsibility, okay? In other words, if you want to go and buy a stereo, that's great. you got the right to do that, but you don't have the right, or you shouldn't uh, blast it out at 2 in the morning in a, in a tightly knitted neighborhood. You like, know? My, like my roommate did last night, of course. <laughs> oh, oops. <laughs> yeah. Very very enthralled with his new vinyl or his uh, vinyl collection, um, but yeah, it's a uh, yeah, it's being free yet responsible. I think is the yeah, simplest way you can put it. Responsible yeah. freedom. With great power comes great responsibility. It might be a exactly. well worn comic book line by now, but it's true. Yeah. All right, my last question for you, very last: Is Mars your real last name? <laughs> it absolutely is. That's uh, but that's with two R's. M -R -R yes. R S. Yes. Uh, I had some old maid aunts that actually put together a Mars history book, and according to them, it saved me a whole lot of time and effort in working in genealogy. Uh, I am related back to the Earl of Mar, M A R, in, uh. Uh, in Scotland, and there's even a castle there. And then he had two sons, uh, James and William. Uh, they uh, immigrated to the United States way back before the revolution and uh, had some property in Virginia. And then when the revolution came along, they actually sided with the Americans. But So they didn't want to get their father in trouble with the crown, so they changed their name to Mars, and they are R-R-S. Ah. And from then, from there, they spread uh, into Tennessee and Kentucky. And then my dad's family came down from Kentucky into Texas, and that's where we come from. Incredible. Yeah, you have that look of that real Scottish Highlander sort of, uh, I don't know, just out on the plains. I could, I, I believe it. I believe it. I think. Well, yeah, and I'll tell you what, they've had all, all of my relatives on my dad's side were all pretty pig headed and individualistic, and I think they got that, that Wallace, you know. Yeah, you, I mean. Brave heart. Yep. Yep, streak of individuality. Absolutely, I think you got it too. Um, is your and I, I honor that. I think we all ought to do that. I mean, number one, I do not want to see a nation of everybody who acts like, talks like, thinks like, dressed like. How boring is that going to be? I oh, think. I think. I think. I, I love the idea that we live in a melting pot of a country that will take in anybody, regardless of race, creed, color, culture, whatever. And mm -hmm. I love to see the plethora of, of different cultures that blend and mix. And, of course, Texas is a prime example because we have lots of German settlers and, of course, a whole lot of Hispanics and, and then people from all over the place piling in. And uh, so that's why down here you speak Texan, you're kind of speaking a blend of, of uh, 
British, proper proper English, American English, Spanish, German. <laughs> you got a little bit of everything down here, and it's great. Yeah. Uh, but but we have to agree that we like that kind of freedom, and and that everybody should be free to honor their own heritage and and uh, do whatever they want to do, as long as they're not harming anybody. You know. You got it. Rugged individualism with responsibility and yeah. lack yeah. of harm. I think. That's what's up. I, if you disagree with that, I don't know what to tell you. You heard it from the man himself. If you um, disagree with that, I got some shackles that uh, <laughs> I will be glad to sell you. You can put on your hands and feet. Sure, maybe some blinders for your eyes, like while you. Yeah, see. right. Um, <laughs> so the la last thing, I guess, um, uh, you certainly can plug anything you want. I wanted to ask: is your is your radio show still on? A view from Mars? I haven't seen that on the wire. Oh, no, that that was kind of short lived. Uh, I thought that was a good idea, but then I was uh, I was told that hey, it would only take up uh, a couple of hours a week. You know? Ah, yeah, right. And, yeah, right. Well, you know better than that. And yep. I found out too, and I found out I simply could not do my research, uh, answer uh, queries, and and do interviews, and write a book, and, and do the radio thing at the same time. So uh, I had to I had to drop that, at least for the time being. You know what? That's okay because you still got so much information out there. Everyone should read all your books, watch everything they can. I mean, just go for it. That's all I can tell people exactly. to do. Um, well, the thing is, with a book, it's printed, it's there, it's solid, it's a material object, and it'll be there long after I'm gone. Uh, if I'm thinking on the radio, you know, it's, it goes out and somebody hears it or doesn't hear it and they remember it or don't remember it and then it goes away. You know? Well, uh, yeah, something like this, you know, it's going to go on YouTube and everything. So uh, until that small company goes out of business, I think uh, it'll be around. So at least, uh, you know, I'm trying to do my part for uh, – putting out there on the archives and getting people yeah. like use well, voices. See, you're, do, you're doing your bit too. Everybody just has to do whatever they can do. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, you know, but just, just don't sit on your tail, you know, do something. Yeah. <laughs> Get off your dust. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jim. I don't know how All many right. ways to thank say you, it. Scott. Yeah. You've been amazing. And that's it. That's a wrap. We'll see you All guys right. soon. All right.